volume two chapter seven of the day will come by mary elizabeth braddon this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven and from that time to this i am alone and i shall be alone until i die theodore and his friend strolled across the park on saturday afternoon in the direction of the west gate cuthbert ramsay intent upon carrying out his intention of introducing himself to mrs porter and theodore submitting meekly to be led as it were into the lion's den you have no idea what hard stuff this woman is made of he said and then he told ramsay what lord cheriton had said to him about mrs porter on the previous evening and how the daughter's life was to be made happy if possible without reference to the mother the harder she is the more i am interested in making her acquaintance replied cuthbert i don't care a jot about commonplace women were they as lovely as aphrodite i go to see this soured widow as eagerly as romeo scaled juliet's balcony did his lordship ever tell you what it was that soured the creature by the way that kind of hardness is generally in some wise the result of circumstance even where there is the adamantine quality in the original character i never heard any details about the lady's past life only that her husband was in the merchant navy upon the india and china line that he died suddenly and left her penniless that she was a lady by birth and education and had married somewhat beneath her i have often wondered how my cousin as a barrister came to be intimate with a captain in the merchant service they were at the gates of the park by this time and close to the rustic steps which led up to mrs porter's garden it was one of those tropical days which often occur towards the end of august and the clusters of cactus dahlias in the old-fashioned border and the tall hollyhocks in the background made patches of dazzling colour in the bright white light against which the cool greys of the stone cottage offered repose to the eye one side of the cottage was starred with passion flowers and on the other the great waxen chalices of the magnolia showed creamy white against the scarlet of the trumpet ash it was the season at which mrs porter's hermitage put on its gayest aspect the crowning feast of bloom and colour before the chilling breath of autumn brought rusty reds and pallid greys into the picture the two young men heard voices as they approached the steps and on looking upward theodore saw the curate and his wife standing on the little grass plot with mrs porter there could hardly be a better opportunity for approaching her as she was caught in the act of receiving visitors and could not deny herself mr and mrs kempster were young people and of that social temperament which will make friends under the hardest conditions mr kempster belonged to the advanced anglican school and ministered the offices of the church as it were with his life in his hand always prepared for the moment when he should come into collision with his bishop upon some question of posture or vestments he had introduced startling innovations into the village church and hoped to be able to paraphrase the boast of augustus and to say that he found cheriton evangelical and left it ritualistic needless to say that while he gratified one half of his congregation he offended the other half and that old-fashioned parishioners complained bitterly of his guffaws fetched from aaron's old wardrobe or the flamen's vestry mrs kempster had hard work enough to do in smoothing down the roughened furs of these antediluvians which smoothing process she effected chiefly by a rigorous system of polite afternoon calls in which no inhabitant of the parish was forgotten and an occasional small expenditure in the shape of afternoon tea and halfpenny buns toasted and buttered by her own fair hands she was a bright good-tempered little woman whom her husband generally spoke of as a body the kempsters had just accepted mrs porter's invitation to tea and were making an admiring inspection of her garden before going into the cottage i don't believe any one in cheriton parish has such roses as you mrs porter said the curate's wife gazing admiringly at the standard gloire de dijon which had grown into gigantic dimensions in the middle of the grass plot i never saw such a tree but then you see you give your mind to your garden as none of us can i have very little else to think about certainly said mrs porter except algernon's sermons i know you appreciate them cried mrs kempster in her chirruping little voice algernon says no one listens as attentively as you do she quite carries me away sometimes with that rapt look of hers he said the other day i am half inclined to feel jealous of you mrs porter oh here is mr dalbrook how do you do mr dalbrook mrs kempster shook hands with theodore before he could approach mrs porter but having got past this vivacious lady he introduced cuthbert ramsay to the mistress of the house my friend is a stranger in the neighbourhood mrs porter he said and he was so struck by the beauty of your cottage yesterday that he set his heart upon being introduced to you and i was really obliged to bring him my cottage is not generally considered a show-place mr dalbrook 
she answered coldly turning her dull grey eyes full upon theodore with a look which made him uncomfortable but i shall be very happy to show it to your friend and his lordship's friend i conclude i don't know if i dare claim that distinction mrs porter answered cuthbert in his cheerful resonant voice this is my first visit to the chase and if lord cheriton has received me with open arms it is only because i am his kinsman's friend theodore introduced the stranger to the kempsters who welcomed him eagerly as one who came fraught with the interests and excitements of the outer world may i ask if our man has got in for southwark demanded mr kempster his lordship would be sure to get a telegram after the polling i blush to say that i forgot all about the election and didn't ask after the telegram replied cuthbert when you say our man you mean the conservative candidate i conclude you belong to us again i blush to say i don't belong to you the least little bit i am an advanced liberal mr kempster sighed with a sigh that was almost a groan a destroyer and disestablisher of everything that has made the glory of england since the days of the heptarchy he said plaintively well yes there have been a good many false gods toppled over and a good many groves of baal cut down since the caxon kings ruled over the seven kingdoms you don't want baal and the rest of them stuck up again do you mr kempster mr ramsay there are times and seasons when i would to god i could wake up in the morning and find myself a subject of king egbert yes when i see the rising tide of anarchy the advancing legions of unbelief the upas tree of sensual science said kempster slipping airily from metaphor to metaphor i would gladly lay hold upon all that was most rigid and uncompromising among the bulwarks of the past i would belong to the church of wolsey and a becket i would lie prostrate before the altar at which st augustine was celebrant i would grovel at the feet of dunstan ah mr kempster we can't go back that's the plague of it for romantic minds like yours i am afraid we have done with the picturesque in religion and in everything else we are children of light of the fierce white light of science and common sense we may regret the scenic darkness of medievalism but we cannot go back to it the clouds of ignorance and superstition have rolled away and we stand out in the open in the searching light of truth we know what we are and whom we serve at mrs porter's invitation they all followed her into the cottage parlour where the tea-table stood ready and much more elegantly appointed than that modest board which the curate's wife was wont to spread for her friends here there appeared both old china and old silver and the tea which mrs porter's slender white hands dispensed was of as delicate an aroma as that choice indian pekoe which theodore occasionally enjoyed in lady cheriton's boudoir mrs porter placed herself with her back to the window but cuthbert's keen eyes were able to note every change in her countenance as she listened to the conversation going on round her or on rare occasions took part in it he observed that she was curiously silent and he was of opinion that theodore's presence was in some manner painful to her she addressed him now and then but with an effort which was evident to those studious eyes of cuthbert ramsay's though it might escape any less keen observer the conversation was of politics and of the outer world for the first ten minutes and was obviously uninteresting to mrs kempster who fidgeted with her teaspoon made several attempts to speak and had to wait her opportunity but finally succeeded in engaging theodore's attention have you seen lady carmichael lately mr dalbrook she inquired i saw her three days ago and how did you find her in better spirits i hope she hardly ever comes to cheriton now and her old friends know very little about her i am told she has a horror of the place though she was once so fond of it poor thing it is only natural you found an improvement in her i hope yes i saw at least the beginning of improvement answered theodore her child gives a new interest to her life what a blessing that is and by and by she will meet some one else who will interest her even more than her baby and she will marry again she is too young to go on grieving for ever don't you think so mrs porter yes i suppose she will forget sooner or later most women have a faculty for forgetting most women but not all women said cuthbert with his earnest air which made the commonest words mean more from him than from other men i do not think you would be the kind of woman to forget very quickly mrs porter she was in no hurry to notice this remark but went on pouring out tea quietly for a minute or two before she replied there is not much room in my life for forgetfulness she said after that protracted pause so without being in any way an exceptional person i may lay claim to a good memory 
she remembers her daughter and yet memory does not soften her heart thought theodore with her memory means implacability he looked round the room in the flickering light of the sunshine that crept in between the bars of the venetian shutters he had not expected ever to be sitting at his ease in mrs porter's parlour after that unpromising conversation upon the first day of the year he looked round the room thoughtfully contemplative of every detail in its arrangement which served to tell him what manner of woman mrs porter was he was not a close student of character like ramsay he had made for himself no scientific code of human expression in eye and lip and head and hand but it seemed to him always that the room in which a man or a woman lived gave a useful indication of that man's or that woman's mental qualities this room testified that its mistress was a lady the furniture was heterogeneous shabby for the most part from an upholsterer's point of view old-fashioned without being antique but there was nevertheless a cachet upon every object which told that it had been chosen by a person of taste from the tall chippendale bureau which filled one corner of the room to the solid carved oak table which held the tea-tray the ornaments were few but they were old china and china of some mark from the collector's point of view the draperies were of madras muslin spotless and fresh as a spring morning theodore noticed however that there were no flowers in the vases and none of those scattered trifles which usually mark the presence of refined womanhood the room would have had a bare and chilly aspect lacking these things if it had not been for a few pictures and for the bookshelves which were filled with handsomely bound books you have a nice library mrs porter he said somewhat aimlessly as he took a cup of tea from her hands i suppose you are a great reader yes i read a great deal i have my books and my garden those make up my sum of life may i look at your books if you like she answered coldly he went about the small low room so low with its heavily timbered ceiling that cuthbert ramsay's head almost touched the crossbeams and surveyed the collection of books in their different blocks whoever had so arranged them had exercised both taste and dexterity everything in the room fitted like a chinese puzzle and everything seemed to have been adapted to those few pieces of old furniture the walnut wood bureau the oak table and the old italian chairs the books were theological or metaphysical for the most part but among them he found carlyle's sartor resartus past and present and french revolution bulwer's mystical stories and a few books upon magic ancient and modern i see you have a fancy for the black art mrs porter he said lightly one would hardly expect to find such books as these in the isle of purbeck i like to know what men and women have built their hopes upon in the ages that are gone she answered those dreams may seem foolishness to us now but they were very real to the dreamers and there were some who dreamed on till the final slumber the one dreamless sleep this was the longest speech she had made since the young men entered her garden and both were struck by this sudden gleam of animation even the large grey eyes brightened for a few moments but only to fade again to that same dull unflinching gaze which made them more difficult to meet than any other eyes theodore dalbrook had ever looked upon that unflinching stare froze his blood he felt a restraint and an embarrassment which no other woman had ever caused him it was different with cuthbert ramsay he was as much at his ease in mrs porter's parlour as if he had known that lady all her life he looked at her books without asking permission he moved about with a wonderful airiness of movement which never brought him into anybody's way he fascinated mrs kempster and subjugated her husband and impressed everybody by that strong individuality which raises some men a head and shoulders above the common herd it would have been the same had there been a hundred people in the room instead of five mrs porter relapsed into silence and the conversation was carried on chiefly by cuthbert ramsay and the curate until mrs kempster declared that she must be going lest the children should be unhappy at her absence from their evening meal i make a point of seeing them at their tea she said and then they say their prayers to me before nurse puts them to bed so prettily and laura sings a hymn with such a sweet little voice i am sure she will be musical by and by if it is only by the way she stands beside the piano and listens while i sing and such an ear as that child has as fine as a bird's you must come and hear her sing abide with me some day mrs porter when you drop in to take a cup of tea mrs porter murmured something to the effect that she would be pleased to enjoy that privilege ah but you never come to tea with me though i am always asking you i am afraid you are not very fond of children i am not used to them and i don't think that children like people who are out of habit of associating with them answered mrs porter deliberately 
i never know what to say to a child my life has been too grave and too solitary for me to be fit company for children the curate and his wife took leave and went briskly down the steps to the lane and theodore made a little movement towards departure but cuthbert ramsay lingered as if he were really loath to go i am absolutely in love with your cottage mrs porter he said it is an ideal abode and i can fancy a lady of your studious habits being perfectly happy in this tranquil spot the life suits me well enough she answered icily perhaps better than any other you have a piano yonder i see he said glancing through the half-open door to an inner room with a latticed window beyond which a sunlit garden on a bit of shelving ground sloped upwards to the edge of the low hillside the garden vanishing into an upland meadow where cows were seen grazing against the evening light this second sitting-room was more humbly furnished than the parlour in which they had been taking tea and its chief feature was a cottage piano which stood diagonally between the lattice and the small fireplace you too are musical i conclude pursued cuthbert like little miss kempster i am very fond of music might we be favoured by hearing you play something i never play before people i played tolerably once perhaps at least my master was good enough to say so but i play now only snatches of music by fits and starts as the humour seizes me she seated herself by the casement with a resigned air as much as to say are these young men never going her long thin fingers busied themselves in plucking the faded leaves from the pelargoniums which made a bank of colour on the broad window ledge you were at home at the time of the murder i suppose mrs porter said cuthbert after a pause during which he had occupied himself in looking at the water-colour sketches on the walls insignificant enough but good of their kind and arguing a cultivated taste in the person who collected them i am never away from home and you heard and saw nothing out of the common course you have no suspicion of any one do you suppose if i had it it would not have been made known to the police immediately after the murder do you think i should hoard and treasure up a suspicion or a scrap of circumstantial evidence till you came to ask me for it she said with suppressed irritation pray forgive me i had no idea of offending you by my question it is natural that any one coming to cheriton chase for the first time should feel a morbid interest in that mysterious murder if you had heard it talked about as much as i have you would be as weary of this subject as i am said mrs porter rather more courteously i have discussed it with the local police and the london police with his lordship with the doctor with mr dalbrook's father with lady carmichael with lady jane carmichael these having all a right to question me and with a good many other people in the neighbourhood who had no right to question me i answer you as i answered them no i saw nothing i heard nothing on that fatal night nor in the week before that fatal night nor at any period of lady carmichael's honeymoon whoever the murderer was he did not come in a carriage and summon my servant to unlock the gate for him the footpath through the park is open all night there was nothing to hinder a stranger coming in and going out and the chances were a thousand to one i fancy against his being observed once clear of the house that is all i know about it and as an old resident upon the property you have no knowledge of any one who had a grudge against lord cheriton or his daughter such a feeling as might prompt the murder of the lady's husband as a mode of retaliation upon the lady or her father i know no such person and i have never considered the crime from such a point of view it is too far-fetched a notion perhaps yet where a crime is apparently motiveless the mainspring must be looked for below the surface only a far-fetched theory can serve in such a case shall i tell you what i think about the murder mr ramsay asked mrs porter looking up at him suddenly and fixing him with those steady grey eyes pray do i think that no one upon god's earth will ever know who fired that shot only at the day of judgment will the murderer stand revealed and then the secret of the crime and the motive will stand forth written in fire upon the scroll that records men's wrongs and sorrows and sins you and i and all of us may read the story there perhaps in that day when we shall stand as shadows before the great white throne i believe you are right mrs porter answered cuthbert quietly holding out his hand to take leave a secret that has been kept for more than a year is likely to be kept till we are all in our graves the murderer himself will be the one to tell it perhaps there are men who are proud of a bloody revenge as if it were a noble deed good day to you mrs porter and many thanks for your friendly reception 
he held the thin cold hand in his own as he said this looking earnestly at the imperturbable face and then he and theodore left the cottage well cuthbert what do you think of that woman asked theodore after they had passed through the gate and into the quiet of the long glade where the fallow deer were browsing in the fading day i think a good deal about her but i haven't thought out my opinion yet has she ever been off her head not to my knowledge she has lived in that house for twenty years i never heard that there was anything wrong with her mentally i believe there is something or has been something very wrong there is madness in that woman's eye it may be the indication of past trouble or it may be a warning of an approaching disturbance she is a woman who has suffered intensely and who has acquired an abnormal power of self-restraint i should like to know her history my god cuthbert cried theodore grasping him by the arm and coming suddenly to a standstill do you know what your words suggest to what your conclusion points the murder of my cousin's husband was an act of vengeance or of lunacy we have made up our minds about that have we not the detective juanita you and i everybody we are looking for some wretch capable of a blindly malignant revenge or for homicidal madness with its unreasoning thirst for blood and here here at these gates is a woman whom you suspect of madness a woman who could have had access to the gardens at any hour who knew the habits and hours of the servants who would know how to elude observation my dear fellow you are going a great deal too far who said i suspected that unhappy woman of homicidal madness the brain disease i suspect in mrs porter is melancholia the result of long years of self-restraint and solitude the not unfrequent consequence of continuous brooding upon a secret grief End of chapter 7volume two chapter eight of the day will come by mary elizabeth braddon this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eight my eyes are dim with childish tears my heart is idly stirred for the same sound is in my ears which in those days i heard that suggestion of cuthbert ramsay's of latent madness in the lodge-keeper came upon theodore like a flash of lurid light and gave a new colour to all his thoughts it was in vain that his friend reminded him of the wide distinction between the fury of the homicidal lunatic and the settled melancholy of a mind warped by misfortune after that conversation in the park he was haunted by mrs porter's image and he found his mind distracted between two opposite ideas one pointing to the man who had claimed mrs danvers as his wife the deserted and betrayed husband of james dalbrook's mistress the other dwelling upon the image of this woman living at his kinsman's gate with an existence which was unsatisfactorily explained by the scanty facts which he had been able to gather about her former history he recalled her conduct about her daughter her cold and almost vindictive rejection of the penitent sinner her stern resolve to stand alone in the world was that madness or the consciousness of guilt or what it was conduct too unnatural to be accounted for easily considerate how he might he had heard often enough of fathers refusing to be reconciled with erring or disobedient children the flinty hardness of a father's heart has become proverbial but an unforgiving mother seems an anomaly in nature he determined upon confiding ramsay's opinion and his own doubts to lord cheriton without delay whatever abnormal circumstances there had been in mrs porter's history her benefactor was likely to be acquainted with them and if those circumstances had affected her intellect it was vital that he should be made aware of the fact before evil of any kind could arise he contrived an after-dinner stroll upon the terrace with his kinsman as upon the previous evening and entered upon the subject without loss of time ramsay and i took our afternoon tea with mrs porter he said indeed how did that come about she is not a sociable person in a general way or accessible to strangers it was to gratify a fancy of ramsay's that i went there he admired her cottage and was interested in her history and took it into his head that she was a woman of exceptional character he was not far wrong there i believe mrs porter is a very hard nut to crack i never have been able to fathom her and yet with your knowledge of her previous history you must have the safest clue to her character i don't know about that there is nothing exceptional in her history and there is much that is exceptional in her character as your friend says pray what was the result of his observation of the lady in the leisure of afternoon tea-drinking 
he believed that he saw the traces of madness in her countenance and manner madness either past present or impending he could not decide which there was not light enough upon the terrace to show theodore any change in his cousin's countenance but the movement of lord cheriton's hand as he took the cigar from his mouth and the sudden slackening of his pace were sufficient indications of troubled thought it could hardly be pleasant for him to hear so melancholy a suggestion about the pensioner whom he had established in comfort at his gate intending that she should enjoy his bounty for all the days of her life upon what does your friend base this fantastical notion he asked angrily upon physiological and psychological evidence you can question him if you like it appears to me that you ought to know the truth i have no objection to hear anything he may have to say but it is very unlikely i shall be influenced by him these young men who are by way of being savants are full of crochets and theories they look at every one as darwin looked at a virginia creeper or a cowship with a preconceived notion that they must find out something about him i believe mrs porter with her calm impassable nature is much better able to reckon up your friend ramsay than he is able to come up to a correct opinion about her i should like to discuss the question with him at any rate said theodore the horror of last year's calamity is a reason you should have nobody about the estate whom you cannot trust what do you mean i mean that while you have madness at your gate you may have murder in your house theodore you cannot be so cruel as to associate that unhappy woman with godfrey carmichael's death god knows that murder has to be accounted for somehow can you as juanita's father no rest or peace till it has been accounted for i could not in your place i hope you do not think it necessary to teach me my duty to my daughter said lord cheriton coldly and theodore felt that he had said too much his cousin addressed him upon some indifferent subject a minute or so afterwards when he had lighted a fresh cigar and his manner resumed its usual friendliness there was no further mention of mrs porter that night but on sunday lord cheriton walked home from church with cuthbert ramsay and questioned him as to his impressions about the lodge-keeper theodore has exaggerated the significance of my remark explained cuthbert i take it mrs porter's case is one of slight aberration brought on by much brooding upon troubles real or imaginary if my power to diagnose is worth anything her mind has lost its balance her thoughts have lost their adjusting power she is like a piece of mechanism that has got out of square and will only work one way you may hardly consider that this amounts to madness and i may have done wrong in speaking of it only were mrs porter concerned in my existence i should feel it incumbent on me to watch her and i recommend you to have her watched so far as it can be done without alarming or annoying her i will do what i can i will get another opinion from a man of long experience in mental cases i have an old friend in the medical profession a specialist who has made mental disease the study of his life he will give me any advice i want you cannot do better than get his opinion of mrs porter if you are interested in her welfare i am interested in all who are dependent upon me and in her especially on account of old associations lady carmichael drove over to cheriton after luncheon upon one of those sunday visits which she paid from time to time in deference to her father albeit she could never approach the house without pain she came in the useful family landau which had carried the mrs carmichael to tennis parties dinners and dances before they married and which now conveyed the nurse and baby on their visits to cheriton she came for what lady cheriton called a long afternoon and she was received in the library which was now the most used room in the house no one cared to occupy that fatal drawing-room and although it was always accessible and there was a feint of daily occupation its cold elegance was for the most part untenanted and over all there hung a cloud of fear to-day for the first time theodore discovered numerous alterations in the arrangement of pictures and furniture in the hall he had promised cuthbert to show him the portraits of the strangways and most particularly that picture of the squire's three children painted nearly forty years before but he found that this picture among others had been removed and that a fine rhodian plate occupied its place on the dark oak panelling he noticed the fact to his cousin i am sorry to miss the family group he said it was a really interesting picture interesting to you perhaps who knew the history of the race answered lord cheriton but very uninteresting to a stranger i think i've made an improvement over there that plate is a splendid bit of colour and lights up a dark corner but that was not my motive 
i wanted to make such trifling alterations as would change the aspect of the hall for juanita without any ostensible refurnishings i have done the same thing in the library the changes there are slight but the room is not as it was when she and her husband occupied it i should like to show ramsay the strangway portraits if they are get at abel they are not just at present the canvases were rotting and i have sent them to london to be lined you can show them to your friend by and by when i get them back mr ramsay's thoughts seemed a long way from the strangway portraits this afternoon although he had expressed a curiosity as to the lineaments of that luckless race he was out in the garden in lady cheriton's rose garden with juanita and her son and was giving further proofs of his adaptability to infantile society the grandmother was of the party looking on with profound admiration at that phase of awakening intellect which is described as taking notice it was held now as an established fact that the infant godfrey james dalbrook took notice and that his notice dwelt with a special favour upon cuthbert ramsay i think it must be because you are so tall and big said juanita lightly he feels your power and he wants to conciliate you artful little beggar no that is much too low a view there is a magnetic affinity between us love at first sight when babies do take a fancy they are thoroughly in earnest about it loafing about in the new cut sometimes studying human nature from the saturday night point of view i have had a poor woman's baby take a fancy to me a poor little elfin creature a year old perhaps and not half so big as this bloated aristocrat a sour-smelling baby which would give you mal au coeur lady carmichael and the wretched little waif would hook on to my elephantine finger and cleave to me as if i were its mother oh how sorry i felt for such a baby with the pure starry eyes of infancy shining in the flabby withered face that has grown old for want of cold water and fresh air for such infancy and for stray dogs i have suffered acutest agonies of pity and yet i have done nothing only pitied and passed on that is the worst of us we can all pity but we don't act upon the divine impulse you may be sure the levite felt very sorry for the wounded traveller though he did not see his way to helping him this was one of cuthbert's tirades which he was wont to indulge in when he found himself in congenial society and juanita's society was particularly congenial to him he felt as if no other woman had ever sympathized with him or understood him and he gave her credit for doing both never had he felt so happy in the society of any woman as he felt in this sunlit garden to-day among the roses which were just now blooming in a riotous luxuriance the branching heads of standards top-heavy with great balls of blossom swaying gently in the summer wind he had expected to see her a gloomy creature self-conscious in her grief but the child's little fingers had loosened her heart-strings if she was not gay she was at least able to endure gaiety in others she listened to the young man's rhapsodies and paradoxes with a gentle smile she admired her mother's roses she cast no shadow upon the quiet happiness of the summer afternoon that tranquil contentedness which belongs to the loveliness of nature and which makes a blessed pause in the story of human passion and human discontent it was one of those summer afternoons which make one say to oneself could life be always thus what a blessed thing it were to live and then the sound of evening bells break the spell and the shadows creep across the woods and it is dinner-time and all that halcyon peace is over how lovely she looked in her simply made black gown with its closely fitting bodice and straight flowing skirt of that thick lustreless silk which falls in such statuesque folds the plain little white crape cap seemed in perfect harmony with that raven hair and pure white forehead she was unlike any other woman cuthbert ramsay had ever known there was not one touch of society slang nor of the society manner of looking at life she had passed through the fiery ordeal of two london seasons unscorched in the furnace love had been the purifying influence she had never lived upon the excitement of everyday pleasures and volatile loves the intermittent fever of flirtations and engagements that are on and off half a dozen times in a season the influence that guided all her thoughts and all her actions had been one steadfast and single-minded love she had cared for no praises but from her lover's lips she had dressed and danced and played and sung for none other than he and now in her devotion to her child there was the same concentration and simplicity she did not know that she was looking her loveliest in that severe black gown and white cap she did not know that cuthbert ramsay admired her far too much for his peace 
she only felt that he was very sincere in his devotion to the baby and that he was a clever young man whose society suggested new ideas and made her for the moment forgetful of her grief it was evening before she left cheriton she had stayed later than usual and the shadows were creeping over the park as she walked to the west gate with theodore and his friend the carriage following slowly with nurse and baby ensconced among light fleecy wraps lest vesper breezes should visit the human blossom too roughly theodore had proposed the walk across the park and juanita had assented immediately i am always glad of a walk she said i have so few excuses for a ramble nowadays i have to stay at home to take care of baby you doubt the capabilities of that highly experienced nurse asked ramsay laughingly i doubt every one but myself and i sometimes doubt even my own discretion where my precious one is concerned you will have more reason to doubt by and by when your precious one is old enough to be spoilt said theodore he has begun to take notice and before very long he will notice that he is monarch of all he surveys and that everybody about him is more or less his slave he will live in that atmosphere till you send him to eton and then he will find himself suddenly confronted with the hard cruel world of strictly republican boyhood which will jostle and hustle him with ruthless equality lady cheriton had business in london early in the following week she was going to london to see her dentist and her dressmaker the latter being one of the arbiters of fashion who never go out of their way to wait upon their clients but who do the rather exact reverence and attention from those clients she had shopping to do at the west end of london that shopping which is so delightful to a lady who spends two-thirds of the year in the country above all she had things to get at the stores an institution which was dear to lady cheriton's heart in spite of all her husband's lectures upon political economy and the necessity of sustaining private enterprise and the shopkeeping interest hearing of the engagements and that lady cheriton intended to spend two nights in victoria street theodore suggested that he should be allowed to accompany her ladyship to london and to arrange a meeting between her and the young woman who called herself marian gray if you really wish to help her he concluded i do really wish it answered lord cheriton earnestly and the sooner the matter is put in hand the better pleased i shall be shall my wife call on this person she is very proud and very reserved it might be better to bring about a meeting which would appear accidental marian goes for a walk with miss newton once or twice a week i could arrange with her good friend that they should be walking in a particular place battersea park for instance at a certain hour and lady cheriton could drive that way with me and we could meet them it would be the easiest way of arriving at the truth as to marian gray's identity with mercy porter very good you might suggest that to my wife lady cheriton who was the soul of good nature fell in at once with theodore's idea i would do anything in my power to help that poor girl she said for i think her sadly to be pitied her girlhood was so dull and joyless such a ceaseless round of lessons and practice without any of those pleasures to which most schoolgirls look forward her mother seemed to take a pride in keeping the girl apart from every one in dressing her plainly and in making her whole life as dreary as she could i hardly wonder that the poor hopeless creature surrendered to the first tempter a man whose manner to women had always been called irresistible even by women of the world and a man who would not shrink from any amount of falsehood in pursuing his wicked aim and now she is paying forfeit for her sin with a lonely life of toil in a london garret poor mercy she was so pretty and so refined a lady in all her instincts cuthbert ramsay left on monday promising to return at the end of the week and theodore went up to town with lady cheriton on the following wednesday he went straight from the terminus to wedgwood street where he saw miss newton told her of lord cheriton's benevolent intentions to marian alias mercy and arranged the walk in battersea park for the following afternoon miss newton and her protege were to be walking upon the pathway beside the river at a half past three o'clock when lady cheriton would drive that way miss newton had no difficulty in carrying out her part of the little plot marian was always ready to put aside her work for the pleasure of an afternoon with that one friend to whom her heart was ever open she met miss newton at the starting-place of the tram-car and they rode through the dusty crowded highways to the people's park where the flower-beds were gaudy with the rank luxuriance that is the beginning of the end of summer's good things and where the geranium leaves were riddled by voracious slugs there was a dustiness and worn-out air upon all the foliage and all the flowers despite the coolness that came from the swiftly flowing river 
an air of fading and decay which pervades even the outermost regions of london when the season is over and the world of fashion has fled the air of a theatre when the play is done and the lights are extinguished sarah newton and her young friend walked slowly along the gravel pathway looking dreamily at the bright river with its gay movement of passing boats and flowing waters the elder of the two friends who was wont to be full of cheery talk of newspapers and books the history of the present and the history of the past was to-day unusually grave and silent i'm afraid you are not well dear miss newton said marian looking at her anxiously oh yes my dear i am well enough you know i am made of cast iron and except for the toothache or a cold in my head i hardly know what illness means i am only a little thoughtful they walked a few paces in silence and then miss newton stopped suddenly to admire an approaching carriage what a stylish victoria why i declare there is mr dalbrook with a lady the carriage drew up as she spoke and theodore alighted marian had reddened a little at the mention of his name but the flush upon her cheek deepened to crimson when she saw the lady in the carriage and as the lady got out and came towards her the crimson faded to a deadly white mercy child i am glad with all my heart to find you said lady cheriton holding out both her hands she was determined that there should be no doubt in the young girl's mind as to her friendship and indulgence that there should be nothing in the mode of her approach in the tone of her voice or the expression of her countenance that could bruise that broken reed love and pity looked out of those lovely southern eyes which even in mature age retained much of their youthful beauty mercy porter went towards her trembling and with eyes brimming with tears the calm self-restrained nature had melted all at once at those gentle words in the familiar voice which had given her words of kindness and of praise in her desolate childhood the transformation filled theodore with wonder dear lady cheriton i thought you would long ago have forgotten the wretched girl to whom you were once so kind she faltered no mercy i have never forgotten you i have always been sorry deeply sorry for you and when mr dalbrook told me about having met a person who interested him a person associated with cheriton i knew that person must be you my dear girl i thank god that we have found you my cousin will call upon you to-morrow and talk to you about your future and of our plans for making your life happier than it is there is no need said mercy quickly i get on very well as i am my life is quite good enough for me i hope for nothing better wish for nothing better nonsense mercy his lordship and i are your friends and we mean to help you i will accept help from no one lady cheriton i made up my mind about that long ago i can earn my own living very well now if ever my fingers or my eyes fail me i can go to the workhouse i am deeply thankful for your pity but i ask for no more i will accept no more we will see about that mercy said lady cheriton with her gentle smile quite unable to estimate the mental force in opposition to her she could understand a certain resistance the pride of a sensitive nature painfully conscious of disgrace unable to forget the past she was prepared for a certain amount of difficulty in reconciling this proud nature to the acceptance of benefits but she never for one moment contemplated an implacable resistance let me see your friend mercy she said the lady who has been kind to you kind is a poor word she has been my angel of deliverance she has saved me from the great dismal swamp of self-abasement and despair miss newton had walked briskly ahead with theodore so as to leave lady cheriton and mercy together mercy ran after her friend and brought her back a little way as lady cheriton advanced to meet her miss newton my one true and good friend in all this great world of london and the only friend of my miserable childhood lady cheriton said mercy looking from one to the other with that intent look of thoughtful minds that work in narrow grooves i thank you for being good to one in whose fate i am warmly interested miss newton said lady cheriton you have done the work of the good samaritan and at least one wounded heart blesses you they walked on a little way together and lady cheriton spoke of the old house and the old family the vanished race with which sarah newton had been associated in her girlhood they are all dead i understand she said in conclusion yes there is none left of the old family they are not a fortunate race and i fear there are few who regret them but i cannot help feeling sorry that they are all gone they have passed away like a dream when one awakens 
lady cheriton lingered on the riverside pathway for nearly half an hour talking to mercy and miss newton theodore left them together after having obtained mercy's permission to call at her lodgings on the following afternoon End of chapter eight volume two chapter nine of the day will come by mary elizabeth braddon this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine i saw her too yes but you must not love her i will not as you do to worship her as she is heavenly and a blessed goddess i love her as a woman a decent-looking woman opened the door of the house in hercules buildings and ushered mr dalbrook up two flights of stairs to the small back room in which mercy porter had lived her lonely life from year's end to year's end the tasteful arrangement of that humble chamber struck theodore at the first glance he had seen such rooms at cambridge where an undergraduate of small means had striven to work wonders with a few shabby old sticks that had done duty for a half a dozen other undergraduates and which had been of poorest quality when they issued new and sticky with cheap varnish from the emporium of a local upholsterer mercy was very pale and although she received her visitor with outward calmness he could see that she had not yet recovered from yesterday's agitation what induced you to take so much trouble to betray me mr dalbrook she asked betray is a very hard word miss porter you don't suppose that i believed yesterday's meeting was accidental you took the trouble to bring lady cheriton across my path in order to satisfy your curiosity about my identity was that generous god knows that it was meant in your best interests i knew that lady cheriton was your true and loyal friend that she had more of the mother's instinct than your real mother and that no pain could possibly come to you from any meeting with her and then i had a very serious reason for bringing you together it was absolutely necessary for me to make sure of your identity why necessary what can it matter to you who i am everything i am the bearer of a very generous offer from lord cheriton and it was essential that i should make that offer to the right person mercy's face underwent a startling change at the sound of lord cheriton's name she had been standing by the window in a listless attitude just where she had risen to receive her visitor she drew herself suddenly to her fullest height and looked at him with flushed cheeks and kindling eyes i will accept no generosity from lord cheriton she said i want nothing from him except to be let alone i want nothing from lady cheriton except her sympathy and i would rather have even that at a distance you have done the greatest harm you could do me in bringing me face to face with my old life believe me i had but one feeling anxiety for your happiness what is my happiness to you she retorted almost fiercely you are playing at philanthropy you can do me no good you may do me much evil you see me contented with my life accustomed to its hardships happy in the possession of one true friend why come to me with officious offers of favours which i have never sought you are ungenerous and unjust from the first hour of our acquaintance i saw that you were of a different clay to that of the women among whom i found you different by education instinct associations family history how could i help being interested in one who stood thus apart how could i help wanting to know more of so exceptional a life yes you were interested as you might have been in any other wreck in any derelict vessel stranded on a lonely shore battered broken empty rudderless picturesque in ruin it was a morbid interest an interest in human misery he stated his commission plainly and briefly he told her that it was lord cheriton's earnest wish to provide for her future life that he was ready and even anxious to settle a sum of money which would ensure her a comfortable income for the rest of her days he urged upon her the consideration of new happiness and larger opportunities of helping others which this competence would afford her but she cut him short with an impatient movement of her head upon what ground does he base his generous offer she asked coldly upon the ground of his interest in your mother and yourself an interest which it is only natural for him to feel in one who was brought up on his estate and whose father was his friend it may be also that he feels himself in some wise to blame for the great sorrow of your life tell him that i appreciate his noble contempt for money his readiness to shed the sunshine of his prosperity upon so remote an outcast as myself but tell him also that i would rather starve to death slowly in this room than i would accept the price of a loaf of bread from his hands 
do not hesitate to tell him this in the plainest form of speech it is only right that he should know the exact measure of my feelings towards him after this theodore could only bow to her decision and leave her lord cheriton is my cousin and a man whom i have every reason to regard with affection and respect he began she interrupted him sharply he has never denied the cousinship never treated you as the dirt under his feet never looked down upon you from the altitude of his grandeur with insufferable patronage never he has been most unaffectedly my friend and ever since i can remember then you are right to think well of him but you must let me have my opinion in peace even although you are of his blood and i am nothing to him good-bye forgive me if i have been ungracious and ungrateful i have no doubt you meant well by me only i would so much rather be let alone it did me no good to see lady cheriton yesterday my heart was tortured by the memories her face recalled she gave him her hand the thin white hand with taper fingers worn by constant work it was a very pretty hand and it lay in his strong grasp to-day for the first time so reserved had been her former greetings and farewells he looked at the delicate hand for a moment or two before he let it go and from the hand upwards to the fair finely cut face and the large dark grey eyes that look of his startled her the hollow cheeks flushed and the eyelids fell beneath his steady gaze good-bye mercy he said gently let me call you mercy for the sake of the link between us the link of common recollections and the sad secrets of the past call me what you like it is not very probable we shall meet often you are very stubborn cruel to yourself and more cruel to those who want to help you good-bye good-bye she echoed almost in a whisper he went out into the shabby street haunted by those sad uplifted eyes and the hollow cheeks faintly flushed with delicate bloom how lovely she must have been in her dawning womanhood and how closely she must have kept at home in the cottage by the west gate seeing that he who had been so frequent a guest at cheriton had never once met her there he was not satisfied to submit to this total failure of his mission without one further effort he went from hercules buildings to wedgwood street and saw his admirable sarah newton into whose attentive ear he poured the story of mercy's obstinacy she is a strange girl a girl who could live in closest friendship with me all this time and never tell me the secret of her past life said miss newton thoughtfully why she should be so perverse in her refusal of lord cheriton's offer i can't imagine but you may depend she has a reason theodore escorted lady cheriton back to dorsetshire by the afternoon train but they parted company at wareham station he going on to dorchester where his sisters received him with some wonderment at his restlessness it is rather a farce for you and mr ramsay to make engagements which you never intend to keep said sophy peevishly and it was thereupon expounded to him that he and his friend had pledged themselves to be present at a certain tennis party upon the previous afternoon i'm very sorry we both forgot all about it he apologized but i don't suppose we were missed i don't suppose you would have been answered his sister sulkily if there had been half a dozen decent young men at the party but as harrington preferred the office to our society or our friends and as there were only three curates and one banker's clerk at mrs hazeldean's you and mr ramsay would at least have been something it is hardly worth any man's while to endure an afternoon's boredom to fetch and carry teacups in a sweltering sun and play tennis upon an unlevel lawn if he is only to count for something a mere make weight oh you young men give yourself such abominable airs nowadays retorted sophy with a manner which implied that the young men of former generations had been modesty incarnate as for your friend he has made a mere convenience of this house as how sophy i don't think the fact requires explanation first he goes to the priory and then to cheriton and then he is off to london and then he is to be back on saturday in order to lunch at the priory on sunday if that is not making an hotel of your father's house i don't know what is perhaps i have been too unceremonious forgetting that i no longer live here that it behoves me now perhaps to act in all things as a visitor it was i who made the engagement sophy you must not be angry with ramsay i am not angry it cannot matter to me how mr ramsay treats this house no doubt he thinks himself a great deal too clever for our society although we are not quite so feather-headed as most girls he finds mental more attractive at the priory what do you mean sophy that he is over head and ears in love with juanita 
it does not need a very penetrating person to discover that what nonsense why he has not seen her above three times quite enough for a young man of his vehement character what can have put such an idea into your head his way of talking about her the expression of his face when he pronounces her name the questions he asked me about her showing the keenest interest in even the silliest details what kind of a girl was she before she married and how long had she known sir godfrey before they were engaged and had their love been a grand passion full of romance and poetry or only a humdrum kind of affection encouraged by their mutual relations idiotic questions of that kind could only be asked by a man who is in love and then how eagerly he snapped at your suggestion that he should go with you to the priory next sunday it may be as you think theodore answered gravely i know his fervid temperament about most things but i did not think he was the kind of man to fall in love upon such very slight provocation she may have given more encouragement than you suppose said sophy he is the kind of man that a frivolous half-educated girl would think attractive she would never find out the want of depth under that arrogant self-assured manner however she has asked janet and me for next sunday and i shall soon see how the land lies you were always unobservant theodore did not try to vindicate his character as an observer albeit he knew no look or tone of his cousin's was likely to escape him that even sharp-eyed malevolence could never watch her more closely than love would watch out of his eyes yes it was not unlikely that cuthbert admired her too much for his own peace he recalled words which had passed unnoticed when they were together poor cuthbert he felt he had done wrong in exposing his friend to such an ordeal who could know her and not love her End of chapter nine volume two chapter ten of the day will come by mary elizabeth braddon this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten for life must life and blood must blood repay cuthbert ramsay arrived at dorchester on saturday just in time to dress for dinner and he contrived to make himself so agreeable to all the family in the course of that friendly meal that janet and sophia forgave him for his base desertion and harrington forgave him for being a great deal cleverer and happier than himself he was in very high spirits had been working hard in london attending lectures witnessing operations and looking after those gratis patients in the slums who were his chief delight i love to find out what life means below the surface he said one only gets at realities when one comes face to face with the struggle for existence the children the poor pinched atomies whom one looks at with a shudder remembering that they are the men and women of the future that is the terrible point to think that in those little half-starved faces one sees the men who are to meet in trafalgar square and unmake our smooth easy world to think that in those wizened morsels of humanity we have all the elements of discord and destruction in the days to come that is the appalling thought it is a thought that should teach us our duty to them said janet what do you take that duty to be to educate them educate yes educate them in the ways of health and cleanliness after we have fed them that i take to be our primary duty to the children as much as to the lower animals you know the old adage miss dalbrook men sana in corpore sano did you ever hear of a sound and a healthy mind in an unsound scrofulous body so long as we leave the little children to semi-starvation we are sacrificing to the demon scrofula which is to our enlightened age what the demon leprosy was to those darker ages whose ignorance we prate about i am not in favour of pauperizing the working classes said harrington the idea of pauperism is a bugbear and a stumbling-block in the path of benevolence do you pauperize an agricultural labourer whose utmost wages are fifteen shillings a week if you provide his children with two good meals of fresh meat in the seven days and so grow better bone and sinew than can be produced upon bread and dripping or bread and treacle do you pauperize a man by giving him a free supply of pure water and larger area rooms than his scanty wages will buy for him to subsidize is not to pauperize mr dalbrook and if england is to hold together upon the old lines during the coming centuries the well-to-do will have to help the poor upon a stronger and wider basis than that on which they have helped them in the past and a good deal of the spare cash that is now being spent on fine clothes and dinner-parties will have to be spent upon feeding and housing the million 
the two young men drove over to millbrook early on sunday morning in order to attend morning service at the picturesque old church matthew dalbrook and his daughters were to join them at the priory in time for luncheon which was to be a regular family party cuthbert was silent for the greater part of the drive and theodore was thoughtfully observant of him yes there might be something in sophy's idea more than once during the long drive the young man's face brightened with a sudden smile a smile of ineffable happiness as of a dreaming lover who sees the gates of his earthly paradise opening sees his mistress coming to meet him on the threshold theodore's heart sank at the thought that sophy had hit upon the truth anyway there was hopelessness in the idea if it were to be theodore's blessed fate to see the one love of his life victorious soon or late after long patience and devoted sacrifice cuthbert must taste the bitterness of having loved in vain but he would hardly be worth of pity perhaps seeing that he had known from the first how the land lay seeing that honour forbade his falling in love with juanita but will honour make a man blind to beauty deaf to the music of a voice impervious to the subtle charms of all that is purest best and loveliest in womanhood theodore began to think that he had done wrong in bringing his friend within the influence of irresistible charms i was a fool to think that he could help himself i was a worse fool to suppose that she will ever care for me the humdrum cousin whom she has known all her life the country solicitor whose image she has always associated with leases and bills of dilapidation and a little less than a gentleman they consigned the dog-cart to the village ostler who was expiating the jovial self-indulgence of saturday night in the penitential drowsiness of sunday morning and they were in their places in the grey old church when lady carmichael came to the chancel pew theodore's watchful eyes followed her from her entrance in the halo of sunshine which was suddenly obscured as the curtain dropped behind her to the moment when she bowed her head in prayer he saw her face brighten as she passed the pew where he and his friend were sitting and he told himself that it was cuthbert's presence which conjured up that happier light in her soft dark eyes on the walk from the church to the priory it was with cuthbert she talked cuthbert the irrepressible who had so much to say that he must needs find listeners it was cuthbert who sat next her at luncheon and who engrossed her attention throughout the meal it was cuthbert who went through the hothouses fern-houses and greenhouses with her after luncheon and gave her practical lessons in botany and entomology as they went along and who promised her some austrian frogs the day was one long triumph for cuthbert ramsay and he gave himself up to the intoxication of the hour as a drunkard surrenders to strong drink unconditionally without thought of the morrow what do you think of your friend's infatuation now asked janet with her most biting accent as she and theodore followed in the horticultural procession she carefully picking up her gown at every one of those treacherous puddles which are to be found in the best regulated hothouses have you any doubt in your mind now no i have no doubt the carriages were at the door half an hour afterwards and all through the homeward drive cuthbert was silent as the grave only as they came into dorchester did he find speech to say i shall have to go back to town early to-morrow morning theodore so soon what an unquiet spirit you are you'll come back to us next friday or saturday i hope i don't know i'll try but i'm rather afraid i can't theodore did not press the point and his friend kept his word and left by the first train on monday morning after having been intolerably stupid on sunday evening according to the sisters who were disposed to think themselves especially ill-used by mr ramsay's obvious infatuation for lady carmichael i was beginning to respect juanita for her conduct in the difficult position of a young widow said sophy but i begin to fear that she is no better than the rest of them and that her leaving off crape upon her last gowns is a sign that she means to marry again before the second year of her widowhood is over lady cheriton's roses were in danger from a failure of the water in that old-fashioned well which had hitherto supplied the flower gardens there had been an unusually long spell of dry weather since the beginning of july and the gardeners were in despair when theodore went over to the chase with his portmanteau in accordance with an engagement made the previous week he found that lord cheriton had that morning given an order for the sinking of the old well from twenty to thirty feet deeper there is plenty of water my lord said the head gardener if we only go deep enough for it very well mackenzie go as deep as you like so long as you don't go below the water-bearing strata you had better put on plenty of hands her ladyship is uneasy about her roses seeing how you have been stinting them lately it has been hard work my lord to do our duty by the roses and keep the lawns in decent order 
the grounds would be hard as iron if we didn't use a good deal of water for the grass get to work mackenzie and don't waste time in talking about it drive over to gadby's and tell him to send some good men this conversation took place upon the terrace directly after theodore's arrival and when the gardener had gone off to the stables to get the dog-cart of all work lord cheriton and his cousin walked in the direction of the well the well was in one of the kitchen gardens quite the oldest bit of garden ground at cheriton a square garden of about two acres shut in with high crumbling old red brick walls upon which grew blue gages and william pears egg-plums and apricots attaining more or less to perfection as the aspect favoured them it was a pleasant garden to dream in upon a summer afternoon for there was an air of superabundant growth that was almost tropical in the century-old espaliers albeit they had long ceased to produce meritorious fruit and in the sprawling leaves and yellow blossoms of the vegetable marrows which seemed to be grown for no purpose except to produce champion gourds or pumpkins to be ultimately hung up as ornaments in the gardener's cottage or to rot in a corner of the greenhouse there is always one old greenhouse in such a garden given over to preserving spiders and accumulating rubbish in the middle of a vegetable marrow warren stood the well a well of eight feet in diameter surrounded by a low brick wall of that same bright red brick which crumbled behind the blue gages and the egg-plums and which the birds pecked and perforated for very wantonness it was a well of the old pattern with a ponderous wooden roller and an iron spindle which had wound up water from those same cool depths for over a hundred years it had run dry often in the time of the strangways that good old well but no strangway had ever thought of improving anything upon the estate so in seasons of drought the flowers had drooped and the turf had withered unheeded by the proprietorial eye mr gadby's men appeared after their dinner and got seriously to work by about three o'clock at which hour theodore and lady cheriton were strolling in the rose garden while the master of the house sat in the library reading theodore had observed a marked change in his cousin since his last visit to the chase there was a worried look in lord cheriton's face which had not been there even after the shock of the murder a look of nervous apprehension which showed itself from time to time in a countenance where firmness of character and an absolute fearlessness had been hitherto the strongest characteristics he had not yet told his lordship the result of his interview with mercy porter he had waited till an opportunity for quiet confidential talk should come about naturally and that opportunity now occurred lady cheriton left him after half an hour's review of the roses and he went through the open window into the library where lord cheriton sat in his large armchair at his own particular table reading the political summing up in the last quarterly shall i be disturbing you if i sit here asked theodore taking a volume from the table where the newest books were always to be found on the contrary i shall be very glad of a little conversation i have been struggling through an analysis of last session which is all weariness and vexation of spirit the session was dull the commentary is duller i am anxious to know how you got on with mrs porter's daughter very badly i regret to say from our point of view she rejects your generous offer she prefers her present hard life with its independence she will accept no obligation from any one humph she must be a curious young woman said lord cheriton with a vexed air i should have liked very much to have made her life bright and easy if she would have let me for her father's sake on what ground did she refuse my offer on the ground of preferring to work for her living and to live a hard life she has taken that upon herself i believe as an expiation for her past errors although she did not say that in so many words she is wonderfully firm i never saw such a resolute temper in so young and so gentle-mannered a woman you tried to overcome her objections you represented to her how easy and pleasant her life might be in some picturesque village among the hills and lakes or by the sea and how she might live among people who would know nothing of her past history who would grow to be fond of her for her own sake i urged all this upon her i am as anxious as you are that she should leave that dreary attic that monotonous labour but nothing i could say was of the least use she was resolute she would accept nothing from you from me ah that is it cried lord cheriton suddenly had the offer come from any one else she might have been less stubborn but from me she will take nothing not a loaf of bread if she were starving that is the explanation of her hardness it is to me she is adamant tell me the truth theodore don't spare my feelings this girl hates me i suppose i fear she has a deeply rooted prejudice against you 
she may most unjustly blame you for her misery because colonel tremaine was your friend yes that is her feeling no doubt it is on that account she hates me perhaps she is justified in her anger i ought to have shot that scoundrel had we both lived fifty years sooner i suppose i should have shot him i don't think you could have been called upon to do that even by the old code of honour mercy was not allied to you no but she dwelt at my gates she was under my protection she had no other man living to defend her i ought to have punished her seducer it was incumbent on me to do it because there was no one else he added slowly after a long pause it may be on that account she rejects your generous offer i cannot pretend to interpret her feelings but there was certainly some strong personal prejudice on her part she was deeply moved she burst into a passion of sobs not from him she cried i will accept nothing from him of all the men upon this earth he shall be the last to help me lord cheriton flung the quarterly from him with a passionate gesture as he started to his feet and began to walk up and down the long clear space in front of the windows theodore he said suddenly you have not yet come face to face with all the problems of life perhaps you have not yet found out how hard it is to help people i would have given much to be able to help that girl to assure her an easy and reputable existence the refinements of life amidst pleasant surroundings what would it matter to me whether i allowed her one hundred or two hundred a year all i desire is that her life should be happy and of deliberate malice of sheer perversity she rejects my help she dooms herself to the seamstress slavery and to a garret in lambeth my god to think that with all the will and all the power to help her i cannot come between her and that sordid misery it is hard theodore it is very hard upon a man like me there is nothing i hold of this world's goods that i have not worked for honestly and when i want to do good for others with what i have won i am barred by their folly it is enough to make me mad never before had theodore seen this self-abandonment in his stately cousin the man who bore in every tone and every gesture the impress of his acknowledged ascendancy over his fellow-men to see such a man as this so completely unhinged by a woman's perversity was a new thing to theodore dalbrook and his heart went out to his kinsman as it had never done before my dear cheriton you have done all that was in your power to do for that mistaken young woman he said holding out his hand which the elder man grasped warmly whatever wrong you may have unwittingly brought about by the presence of a blackguard under your roof you have done your best to atone for that wrong the most sensitive the most punctilious of men could do no more i thank you theodore for your sympathy yes i have done my best for her you will bear witness to that a father could scarcely do more for an erring daughter i only wish her mother felt half as kindly towards her as you upon whom her claim is so slight no no it is a substantial claim she is fatherless and her mother is dependent upon me i stand as it were in loco parentis well we will say no more about her she must go her own way only if ever you find an opportunity of helping her for me you will do me a great favour by taking prompt advantage of it i shall gladly do so i am interested in her for her own sake as well as for yours you are a good fellow theodore and i know you wish us well i will go a step further than that and say i know that i can trust you this was said with an earnestness which impressed theodore it seemed to him almost as if his kinsman foresaw that inevitable hour in which there must be perfect unreserve between them in which the younger man would have to say to his senior and superior in rank i know the secret of your earlier years i know the dark cloud that has overshadowed your life they talked for a little while of indifferent subjects and then lord cheriton proposed a stroll in the direction of the well i should like to see whether those fellows have begun work he said the old garden looked its sleepiest in the westering sunlight but there was business going on there nevertheless and a great heap of damp clay had been flung out by the side of the low brick parapet two men were at work below and there were two men above while a fifth a foreman and leading light looked on and gave directions glad to see you've tackled the job carter said lord cheriton yes my lord we've got on to it pretty well could i have a word with your lordship certainly as many words as you like how mysterious you look carter there is nothing in your communication that mr dalbrook is not to hear i suppose 
no my lord mr dalbrook don't matter but i thought you wouldn't care for anybody to know lest it should get round to her ladyship and give her a scare what are you driving at carter with your ladyships and your scares have you seen a ghost at the bottom of the well no my lord but the men found this on the surface clay and i thought it might have some bearing upon last year the murder he dropped out his words hesitatingly as if he hardly dared approach that ghastly theme and then took something out of his jacket pocket and handed it to lord cheriton it was a colt's revolver by no means of the newest make rusted by lying long under water the foreman had amused his leisure since the discovery in trying to rub off the rust with a large cotton handkerchief assisted by his corduroy coat-sleeve and had succeeded in polishing a small silver plate upon the butt of the pistol so as to make the initials t d engraved upon it easily decipherable there was not much in the discovery perhaps but by the ghastly change in lord cheriton's face theodore saw that to him at least it appeared of fatal significance his hand shook as it held the pistol his eyes had a look of absolute horror as they scrutinized it and nothing could be more obvious than the effort with which he controlled his agitation and looked from the builder's foreman to theodore with an assumption of tranquillity it may mean much or nothing carter he said putting the pistol in his coat pocket it was quite right of you to bring the matter before me i thought the initials on the pistol might lead to something being found out my lord said the foreman i don't think there can be much doubt the murderer chucked it in there don't you i have gone into the subject of circumstantial evidence a little deeper than you have carter it was my trade don't you know just as laying bricks was yours and i can tell you that the odds are ten to one against this pistol having belonged to the murderer do you think it likely that the man who shot sir godfrey carmichael would have gone out of his way to throw his pistol down that particular well i don't know about that my lord it would have been a safe hiding-place if the water hadn't given out and would be in his way if he were making for the west gate he could hardly have taken a shorter cut than across this garden perhaps not if both the garden doors were open that night i don't think anybody ever saw them shut my lord night or day answered carter with respectful persistency theodore knew by the very look of the clumsy wooden doors pushed back against the old wall with rusty hinges and with the tendrils of vine or plum tree growing over their edges that the man was right the path across this garden and the next garden led in a direct line to the west lodge and it was by this way by which the servants went on most of their errands to the village the one idea suggested by the choice of that hiding-place was that the person who threw away that pistol was familiar with the premises the well was about thirty feet away from the path and screened by the old espaliers there was a gap in the espaliers where an ancient and cankered apple tree had been taken out and it was by this opening that the gardeners generally went to draw water they had trodden a hard foot-track in their going and coming it was always possible that a stranger exploring the grounds furtively and in haste might have been sharp enough to hit upon the well as a safe and handy hiding-place it would of course have been vital to the murderer to get rid of his weapon as soon as possible after the deed was done lest he should be taken red-handed and with that piece of evidence upon him theodore saw in that pistol with the initials t d confirmatory evidence against the husband of mrs danvers the one person in the world who had ground for an undying hatred of lord cheriton and his race he made no remark upon the discovery of the weapon fearing to say too much and he waited quietly to see how his kinsman would act in the matter that ghastly change in lord cheriton's countenance as he examined the pistol suggested that he had come to the same conclusion as theodore remorse and horror could hardly have been more plainly expressed by the human countenance and what remorse could be more terrible than that of the man who saw the sin of his youth visited upon his innocent daughter shall you take any steps with reference to this discovery asked theodore when they had gone half-way back to the house in absolute silence what steps can i take do you think send for another london detective or for the same man again and give him the pistol to what end he would be no nearer finding the murderer because of the finding of the pistol the initials might lead to identification did you ever hear of such a thing as a second-hand pistol and do you think an assassin would make use of a pistol with his own initials upon it to commit murder i do not not the professional assassin but we are all agreed that this murder was an act of vengeance for some reason at present unknown and the semi-lunatic who would commit murder for such a motive would not be likely to do his work very neatly his brain would be fevered by passion or alcohol in all probability and he would go to work blindly 
that is no more than a theory and my experience has shown me that such theories are generally falsified by fact the murder was so far neatly done that the murderer got clear off in spite of a most rigorous search i doubt if the pistol with initials which may belong to anybody in the world will help us to track him after more than a year then you mean to do nothing in the matter i think not i cannot see my way to doing anything at present but if you like to take the pistol to scotland yard and see what impression it makes upon the experts there i should much like to do so i cannot ignore the fact that so long as sir godfrey's murderer remains undiscovered there is a possibility of peril for you and for juanita and for juanita's child who can tell whether that deadly hatred is appeased whether the man who killed your daughter's husband is not on the watch to kill you or your daughter when he sees his opportunity as for myself i must take my chance i would to god that the ball had struck me instead of my son-in-law it would have been better a lighter chastisement i have lived my life i have done all i ever hoped to do in this world a few years more or less could matter very little to me and yet life is sweet theodore life is sweet however heavily we are handicapped we most of us would choose to finish our race there was infinite melancholy in his tone the melancholy of a man who sees the shadows of a great despair darkening round him the melancholy of a man who gives up the contest of life and feels that he is beaten do not say anything to my wife about this business he said let her be happy as long as she can she has not forgotten last summer but she is beginning to be something like what she was before that blow fell upon us the advent of juanita's baby has worked wonders there is something to look forward to in that child's existence life is no longer a cul-de-sac there is one thing to be done said theodore after an interval of silence the bullet was kept of course yes it is in the possession of the police i believe would it not be well to ascertain if it fits the pistol you have in your pocket yes i will go to the station to-morrow and look into that there was no more said about the pistol that evening theodore felt that it would be cruelty to dwell upon the subject seeing that his kinsman had been deeply affected by the discovery and that he was oppressed by a gloom which he strove in vain to shake off it was evident to theodore that those initials on the pistol had a terrible meaning for lord cheriton that he recognized in those initials the evidence of an injured husband's vengeance a hatred which had been undiminished by the lapse of years he told himself that the tardiness of that revenge might be accounted for by various contingencies any one of which would lessen the improbability of that long interval between the wrong done and the retribution exacted it might be that the murderer had been an exile in a distant world it might be that he had been a criminal fretting himself against the bars of a felon's prison nursing his anger in the dull dead days of penal servitude such things have been it was clear to theodore dalbrook that in those initials upon the colt's revolver lay the clue to the murderer and that lord cheriton shrank with horror from the revelation which those two letters might bring about yet whatever evil might come upon the master of cheriton out of the secret past it was vital that the murderer should be found lest his second crime should be more hideous than his first and theodore was resolved that he would spare no effort in the endeavour to find him living or dead god grant that i may find a grave rather than a living man he thought for cheriton's sake god grant that he may be spared the humiliation of having his story told to all the world he went into cheriton village early upon the following afternoon and dropped in upon the doctor an old inhabitant whose father and grandfather before him had prescribed for all the parish rich and poor mr dolby par excellence dr dolby was a bachelor a spare sharp-visaged man of about forty social and expansive a keen sportsman and a good billiard player a man whose lines had been set in pleasant places for he had inherited a roomy old cottage with capacious stabling and twenty acres of the fattest meadowland in cheriton parish and he led exactly that kind of life which is so loved it would have been no gain to such a man to have changed places with baron rothschild or lord salisbury he would have been in all that constitutes human happiness a loser by such an exchange so cheery a person was naturally popular in a narrow world like cheriton and mr dolby was a general favourite 
a favourite in polite society and in the billiard-room at the cheriton arms which in default of a club served as the afternoon and evening rendezvous for lawyer doctor and the tenant farmers of a gentlemanly class the smock-frock farmers and tradespeople having their own particular meeting-place at the old house at home a public house at the other end of the village theodore had known mr dolby from his childhood and the medical adviser of cheriton was an occasional dropper in at the luncheon-table in cornhill when business transactions with his tailor or his banker took him to the county town there was nothing unusual therefore in theodore's afternoon call at dovecotes a somewhat picturesque name which had been given to the doctor's domicile by his predecessor who had devoted his later years to an ardent cultivation of barbs and jacobins and other aristocratic birds and who had covered a quarter of an acre of garden ground with pigeon-houses of various construction theodore found mr dolby smoking his afternoon pipe in the seclusion of his surgery he had made a long morning round had driven something between twenty and thirty miles and considered himself entitled to what he called his otium cum whisky and water which refreshment stood on a small table at his elbow while he lolled in his capacious easy-chair he welcomed his visitor with effusion and insisted on calling for another siphon and having another little table arranged at the elbow of the other easy-chair make yourself comfortable old chap and let us have a jaw he said i haven't seen you for ages are you at the chase they talked of the usual village topics glanced at the great world of politics speculated upon the prospects of the shooting season and then theodore approached the real business of his visit there is a fellow i am interested in from a business point of view he began who has been hanging about this place off and on for the last five-and-twenty years i believe though i have never happened to meet him he is a drinking man and altogether a bad lot but it is my business to hunt him down on account of some property i suppose yes on account of some property now i know what an observer you are dolby and what a wonderful memory you have i haven't wasted it up in london interjected dolby a week in oxford street and the strand would take ten years off my memory it's pretty clear at present thank god well now what about this fellow what kind of a fellow is he a gentleman or a cad he was once a gentleman but he may have tumbled pretty low by this time he was going downhill at a good pace five-and-twenty years ago egad then he must be at the bottom of the hill i take it what is he like fat or lean dark or fair short or tall a tall man fair complexion a man who has once been handsome a showy-looking man answered theodore quoting the house agent that will do yes just such a man as that was at the arms one night six eight upon my word i believe it must have been ten years ago a man who put on a good deal of side though his clothes were no end seedy ragged edges to his trousers don't you know and though his hand shook like an aspen leaf i played a fifty game with him and i should say though i beat him easy that he had once been a fine player he was in wretched form poor creature but ten years ago do you really think it was as long ago you saw him i know it was it would be in seventy four that was the year potter was returned from screwmouth i remember we were all talking of the election the night that fellow was there yes i remember him perfectly a tall fair man a wreck but with the traces of former good looks i fancy he must have been a soldier he slept at the arms that night and i met him rather early next morning before nine o'clock coming away from the chase met him within ten yards of the west lodge did he talk about lord cheriton a good deal talked rather wild too and would have blackguarded your cousin if we hadn't shut him up pretty sharply he pretended to have been intimate with him before he made his way at the bar and he talked in the venomous way a man who has been a failure very often does talk about a man who has been a success it's only human nature i suppose there's a spice of venom in human nature have you never seen this man at cheriton since that occasion never within the last ten years never and i should be inclined looking at the gentleman from a professional point of view to believe that he must have been under the turf for a considerable portion of that period i don't think there could have been three years life in the man i played billiards with that evening hard lines for him poor beggar if there was property coming to him he looked as if he wanted it bad enough what had he been doing at the chase do you suppose i haven't the least idea i was driving in my cart when i passed him i looked back and watched him for two or three minutes he was walking very slowly and with a languid air 
like a man who was not used to walking ten years no theodore i don't think it's possible such a shaky subject as that could have lasted ten years one certainly does see very miserable creatures crawling on for years after they have been ticketed for the undertaker but this man no i don't think he could hold out long after that october morning i fancy he was booked for a quick passage he may have pulled himself together and turned over a new leaf too old and too far gone for that or what if he had done something bad and got himself shut up for a few years penal servitude do you mean well that might do something it's a very severe regimen for the habitual drunkard and it means kill or cure in this case i should say decidedly kill but it might cure i should think the chances of cure were as two and two hundred i won't say it would be impossible not having examined the patient but so far as observation can teach a man anything observation taught me that the case was hopeless and yet it is my belief that this man was at cheriton some time last year you know everybody and talk to everybody my dear dolby i wish you'd find out for me whether i am right i'll do my best answered mr dolby cheerfully if the man has been seen by anybody in the village i ought to be able to hear about him everybody was tremendously on the lookout last year after the murder and no stranger could have escaped observation perhaps not but before the murder anybody who had been seen shortly before the murder would have been remembered and talked about you can have no idea of the intense excitement that event caused among us we seemed to talk of nothing else and to think of nothing else for months and you suppose that if the man i want had been about for a few hours only just long enough to come and go away again on that fatal night he would have been remembered i am sure of it he would have inevitably been taken for the murderer remember we were all on the alert ready to fix upon the first suspicious-looking person our memory could suggest to us do you think johnson would remember the man johnson was the proprietor of the sheraton arms my dear fellow did you ever find johnson's memory available about any transaction six months old johnson's memory is steeped in beer buried in flesh johnson is a perambulating barrel of forgetfulness a circumambulatory hogshead of stupidity ask johnson to tell you the christian name of his grandmother and i would venture a new hat he would be unable to answer you there is nothing to be got out of mine host of the chariot and arms be sure of that i'm afraid you are right said theodore he felt as if he had come to a point at which there was no thoroughfare there was the pistol with the initials t d and he had made up his mind that the man for whom these initials had been engraved was the man who gave his name as danvers when he called upon the house agent the man whose wife had been known for years as mrs danvers he had made up his mind that this man and no other had murdered godfrey carmichael that many years after the wife's death the husband had returned from exile or imprisonment embittered so much the more so much the more vindictive so much the more malignant for all that he had suffered in that interval and had taken the first opportunity to attack a hated household that he would strike again if he should be allowed to live and be at large theodore had no doubt a second murder and a third murder seemed the natural sequence of the first he remembered the murders of the jermys at stanfield hall the savage hatred which tried to slay four people two of whom were utterly unconnected with the wrong that called for vengeance in the face of such a story as that of the murderer rush who could say that theodore's apprehension of an insatiable malignity wreaking itself in further bloodshed was groundless he left dovecotes disheartened hardly knowing what his next step was to be and very hopeless of tracking a man who so contrived as to be unseen upon his deadly errand he must have come and gone verily like a thief in the night sheltered by darkness meeting no one and yet there was the evidence of the servants at the inquest who swore to having heard mysterious footsteps outside the house late at night upon more than one occasion shortly before the murder if the murderer had been about upon several nights creeping round by the open windows of the reception rooms watching his opportunity what had he done with himself in the day where had he hidden himself how had he evaded the prying eyes of a village which is all eyes all ears for the unexplained stranger End of chapter 10
volume two chapter eleven of the day will come by mary elizabeth braddon this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eleven when haughty expectations prostrate lie and grandeur crouches like a guilty thing theodore walked moodily along the lane leading to the west gate brooding over discrepancies and difficulties in the case which he had set himself to unravel as he drew near mrs porter's cottage he saw lord cheriton come out of the porch unattended he came slowly down the steps to the gate with his head bent and his shoulders stooping wearily an attitude which was totally unlike his usual erect carriage an attitude which told distinctly of mental trouble theodore overtook him and walked by his side at the risk of being considered intrusive he was very curious as to his kinsman's motive for visiting mrs porter after yesterday's conversation about mercy have you been trying to bring about a reconciliation between mother and daughter he asked no i have told you that little good could result from bringing those two obstinate spirits together you have seen for yourself what the daughter can be how perverse how cruel what a creature of prejudice and whim the mother's nature is still harder what good could come of bringing such a daughter back to such a mother no it was with no hope of reconciliation that i called upon mrs porter i have been thinking very seriously of your friend ramsay's suggestion of mental trouble i regret that i did not act upon the hint sooner and get my friend mainwaring to see her and advise upon the case i shall certainly consult him about her but as he has a very important practice and a large establishment under his care it may be very difficult for him to come to cheriton i think therefore it might be well to send her up to the neighbourhood of london to some quiet northern suburb for instance within half an hour's drive of mainwaring's asylum which is near cheshunt then if it should be deemed advisable to place her under restraint for a time though i cannot suppose that likely the business could be easily accomplished your idea then would be to take her up to london with her servant as soon as i have found comfortable lodgings for her in a quiet neighbourhood i have proposed the journey to her this afternoon on the ground of her being out of health and in need of special advice i told her that people had remarked upon her altered appearance and that i was anxious she should have the best medical care she did not deny that she was ailing i think therefore there will be very little difficulty in getting her away when i am ready to remove her what is your own impression as to her mental condition i regret to say that my impression very much resembles that of your friend i see a great change in her since i last had any conversation with her yes i fear that there is something amiss and that it is no longer well for her to live in that cottage with a young girl for her only companion it would be far better for her to be in a private asylum where hers being a very mild case life might be made easy and agreeable for her i know my friend mainwaring to be a man of infinite benevolence and that there would be nothing wanting to lighten her burden he sighed heavily there was a look in his face of unutterable care of a despondency which saw no issue no ray of light far off in the thickening gloom theodore thought he looked aged by several years since yesterday as if the evidence of the pistol had struck him to the heart he knows now that it was his own sin that brought about this evil thought theodore he could conceive the agony of the father's heart knowing that for his own wrong-doing his innocent daughter had been called upon to make so terrible an expiation he could penetrate into the dark recesses of the sinner's mind where remorse from that early error and for all the false steps which it had necessitated dominated every other thought till yesterday james dalbrook might have supposed his sin a thing of the past atoned for and forgiven its evil consequences suffered in the past the account ruled off in the book of fate and the acquittance given to-day he knew that his sin had cost him his daughter's happiness and over and above that horror of the past there lay before him the hazard of some still greater horror in the future could anybody wonder that his eyes were sunken and dull as they never had been before within theodore's memory could anybody wonder at the strained look in the broad open forehead beneath which the eyes looked out wide apart under strongly marked brows or at the hard lines about the mouth which told of sharpest mental pain late that evening when lady cheriton had gone to bed theodore approached the subject of the pistol did you compare the ball with the revolver that we found yesterday he asked yes the ball fits the bore i don't know that the fact goes to prove much but so far as it goes it is now in the knowledge of our local police 
unfortunately they are not the most brilliant intellects i know of if you will let me have the pistol to-night before we go to bed i will go up to town by an early train to-morrow and take it to scotland yard as you suggested i suggested nothing of the kind my dear theodore i attach very little importance to the discovery of the pistol as a means towards discovering the murderer i said you might take it to scotland yard if you liked that was all i should like to do so i should feel better satisfied oh satisfy yourself by all means interrupted lord cheriton irritably you are great upon the science of circumstantial evidence there is the pistol taking it out of a drawer in the large writing-table do what you like with it you are not offended with me i hope no i am only tired tired of the whole business and of the everlasting talk there has been about it if it is a vendetta if the hand that killed godfrey carmichael is to kill me and my daughter and her son if my race is to be eradicated from the face of this earth by an unpeaceable hatred i cannot help my fate i cannot parry the impending blow nor can you or scotland yard protect me from my foe theodore scotland yard may find your foe and lock him up i doubt it but do as you please theodore's train left wareham at nine o'clock there was a still earlier train at seven by which farmers and other enterprising spirits who wanted to take time by the forelock were accustomed to travel but to be in time for the nine o'clock train theodore had to leave cheriton at a quarter to eight and to drive to the distant town in the dog-cart made and provided for station work and drawn by one of two smart cobs kept for the purpose he left the park by the west gate he had to wait longer than usual for the opening of the gate and when the chubby-cheeked maid-servant came down the steps with a key in her hand and unlocked the gate there was that in her manner which indicated a fluttered mind oh if you please sir i'm sorry to keep you waiting so long but i couldn't find the key just at first though i thought i'd hung it up on the nail last night after i locked the gate but i was so upset at my mistress leaving so suddenly never saying a word about it beforehand that i hardly knew what i was doing theodore stopped the groom as he drove through the gate he had a few minutes to spare and could afford himself time to question the girl who had a look of desiring to be interrogated what is this about your mistress leaving suddenly he asked do you mean that mrs porter has gone away on a journey yes indeed sir she that never left home before since i was a child for i've known her ever since i can remember and never knew her to be away for so much as a single night and the first thing this morning when i was lighting the kitchen fire she opens the door and just looks in and says martha i'm going to london don't expect me back till you see me there's a letter on the parlour table she says let it lie there till it's called for don't you touch it nor yet the box and she shuts the kitchen door and walks off just as quietly as if she was going to early church as she has done many a time before it was daylight i was that upset that i knelt before the stove a good few minutes before i could realize that she was gone and then i run out and looked after her she was almost out of sight walking up the lane towards cheriton had she no luggage did she take nothing with her nothing not so much as a handbag. what time was this it struck six a few minutes after i went back to the kitchen what about the letter and the box your mistress spoke of there they are sir on the parlour table where she left them i'm not going to touch them said the girl with emphasis she told me not and i'm not going to disobey her to whom is the letter addressed do you mean who it's for sir yes it's for his lordship and is to lie there till his lordship sends for it in that case i may as well give it to his lordship's servant who can take it up to the house presently i don't know if that will be right sir she said it was to be called for then we call for it i his lordship's cousin and james his lordship's groom won't that do for you i suppose that will be right sir the girl answered doubtfully the letter and the box are both on the table and i wasn't to interfere with either of em and i'm not going to it that's all i can say the girl was swollen with the importance of her mission as being associated with a mystery and she was also in lively dread of her very severe mistress who might come down the lane at any moment and surprise her in some act of dereliction theodore passed her by and went into the sitting-room where he had taken tea with the kempsters and cuthbert ramsay a letter lay on the carved oak table in front of the window and beside the letter there stood a walnut wood box eighteen inches by nine the letter was addressed in a bold characteristic hand to lord cheriton to be called for 
the box had a small brass plate upon the lid and a name engraved upon the plate thomas c darcy ninth foot no one who had ever seen such a box before could doubt that this was a pistol case it was unlocked and theodore lifted the lid one pistol lay in its place neatly fitted into the velvet lined receptacle the place for the second pistol was vacant theodore took the colt's revolver from his pocket and fitted it into the place beside the other pistol it fitted exactly and the two pistols were alike in all respects alike as to size and fashion alike as to the little silver plate upon the butt and the initials t d thomas darcy darcy was the name of evelyn strangway's husband and one of those pistols which had belonged at some period to evelyn strangway's husband had been found in the well in the fruit garden and the other in possession of lord cheriton's protege and pensioner the humble dependent at his gates mrs porter theodore changed his mind as to his plan of procedure he did not send mrs porter's letter to lord cheriton by the groom as he had intended after he himself had been driven to wareham his journey to london might be deferred now indeed in his present condition of mind he was not the man to interview the authorities of scotland yard he left mrs porter's letter in its place beside the pistol case and wrote a hasty line to his kinsman at mrs porter's writing-table where all the materials for correspondence were arranged ready to his hand the west lodge eight fifteen pray come to me here at once if you can i have made a terrible discovery there is a letter for you mrs porter has gone to london he put these lines into an envelope sealed it and then took it out to the groom who was waiting stolidly neatly tickling the cob's ears now and again with an artistic circular movement of the lash which brought into play all the power and ease of his wrist drive back to the house with that note as fast as you can said theodore and let his lordship know that i am waiting for him here End of chapter eleven